my name is Vivek. Uh, you know, I'm part of uh, this very young organization called Karya Inc., uh, uh, you know, which is in the space of digital work. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, this idea of data cooperatives uh, you know, to address some very relevant problems in, in, the, in, the, in the AI and the data ecosystem. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, uh, in Joa's talk, in the last interaction that he had you know, with uh, a question from there, really summarizes my old talk. So uh, you know, <laughs> let's see where we're going here. So uh, as you know, AI is everywhere. Right? Uh, I, I drove from uh, Chicago today morning. Uh, I left Chicago at 5 AM. Uh, hoping to be here at 8.30 a.m., and then I realized Michigan is one hour ahead. And then, you know, when I reached here, it was already 9.30, and, you know, Christian's talk was underway. But as I was driving this rental car, uh, you know, I put it on cruise control, and, uh, you know, it took control of the steering, right? Uh, you know, and I suddenly noticed that there is this new technology called, you know, lane tracker, which will automatically track the lane for you, and you don't even have to control the steering, right? Where is this technology coming from? Right? This technology is coming from the high quality data annotations that people are providing. Right? We need really high quality data to create AI that can help us. Right? Be it you know, annotating uh, uh, images of roads with uh, vehicles and lanes and lane markers, or you know, uh, segmenting newspaper images into uh, individual articles and classified so that we can build accessible information to people who may not be able to uh, read newspapers. We need really high quality data to create high quality AI. Today, this is roughly a $40 billion industry, right? this AI data annotation market. And uh, it is expected to grow to 100 billions in the, in, in the near future. Right? So what does this ecosystem look like today? So on the one end, there are organizations that are interested in data services. Right? These are organizations that are creating uh, these AI services, be it you know, a car manufacturing company building this uh, you know, lane tracking AI, or open AI building, uh, building its uh, you know, chat GPT and uh, you know, other tools that people are using. And in the other end, we have data workers who are generating and annotating the data that is used by uh, these AI services companies. Right? And linking these two extremes are organizations that are actually providing uh, uh, data to, 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 to these data services companies. And the goal of these organizations is to sort of liaison between these organizations which want data and workers who are providing the data, and then you know, adding, uh, doing quality checks, validation, additional annotations, and then providing, provide, providing the data back. Right? So the data is flowing in this direction, from, from data workers all the way to the data uh, uh, organizations that require the data. Right? And there are many good things about, about data work. Right? Uh, and, and when I say data work, it can be uh, generating new data, or annotating existing data, or you know, enriching data that is already available. So the first thing which is good is there is just massive amounts of work available. I mean, like I said, you know, AI is everywhere. Uh, 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 it is penetrating all walks of life. And uh, if I want to generate good AI, I need good data. And therefore, there's going to be a lot of work that, that arises out of it. And the second good thing is it's predominantly di digital. right? So it doesn't matter where the person doing the work is and where the person providing the work is. Right? A company sitting in the US which wants data can remotely provide work to a person remotely sitting in a village in, in India. Right? And which means, you know, because of this disconnect, the work can be shipped anywhere, uh, anytime. And finally, there's, because of the high value of the data that is being generated, there's potentially a high pay rate possible for this type of work. Right? So all these are really good things about, about, about data work. But of course, you know, these three things also make it possible for exploitation. Right? The, the, the ingredients for empowerment also turn out to be the ingredients for exploitation. Right? So I'm going to talk about two problems specifically uh, that, arises in this, in this, in this, that, that exist in this ecosystem today, and you know, how uh, a data cooperative-based approach can potentially address those two problems. Right? So the first problem is that of you know, uh, low wages. And I, sh I showed you know, the data flowing you know, from data workers to uh, uh, the, the organizations that are interested in data. The money flows in the other direction, of course. You know, once, once they receive the data, they're going to pay uh, the companies that are providing the data, and the companies that are providing the data are eventually going to pay their workers. Right? Unfortunately, this is how the uh, money flow looks like. Right? There is a huge, because the data, uh, the, the companies that are interested in data, they're not directly talking to the data workers. Uh, there's a disconnect in how much they value the data 
and the labor cost of actually creating the data, right? Uh, and, and, and today, you know, we estimate this difference between, to be anywhere between, uh, you know, 40x to 100x, right? In terms of how much value is there for data generation and how much the labor cost is for data generation. Actually, you know, research from uh, the International Labor Organization essentially shows that in, in, in the United States, uh, for data workers, uh, you know, the hourly wage rate is around, you know, 4.7. And it's like 2.2 in Africa and like 1.33 in, in, in Asia. And uh, uh, this is a published report. But if you actually, you know, anecdotally uh, conversations on the ground and, you know, recent uh, journal uh, publications show that, you know, this, this, these rates are even lower than the numbers that are here. And, and because, you know, the whole, whole, whole space is very opaque, and right? I mean, people are working from home or, you know, the, the, the market is not that highly regulated, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, uh, even uh, control uh, some of these wages, right? The second problem is, uh, you know, that of, uh, I mean, what I call as a disproportionate share of value being given uh, to the workers who are generating data. And uh, this sort of very closely relates to the, you know, the question that uh, was asked to Zhao. Uh, you know, there are people who are creating this artistic work, and uh, you know, there are companies that are using that work to uh, create uh, their own uh, machine learning models. Uh, uh, and so, really, what happens here is the data flows. Why do the companies? Are, why are the companies interested in data? Because you know, they want to create AI services. And why are they creating those AI services? Because that's going to make them money. How much money is it making them? This is how it looks like today, right? Uh, uh, so there is the second level of gap between the amount of value that is created by AI services uh, and the value that is given to the data workers that created the data that generated the AI in the first place. Right? So uh, again, this, this sort of uh, plays out in every single domain. Uh, here, here is an article uh, you know, on um, uh, uh, this technology called TTS, which is uh, text-to-speech uh, systems, right? Where uh, you can give AI a piece of text and it will read out that piece of text as though a human was reading it out. I mean, we all see it in, in, in everyday life. I mean, you call, uh, you know, some automated system, uh, the, the, the recording on the other side is often, uh, you know, generated by text-to-speech systems, right? Now, the problem with text-to-speech systems is how is it created? Some voice artist provided hundreds of hours of their voice uh, to, to, to a company which, will, which can then use that to go and generate technology which can translate any piece of text to a recording from that person's voice, right? Now, this particular system can potentially, it's, it's, it's a powerful system, it can potentially save a lot of money for the organization or create a lot of money in terms of the service that the organization is providing, in terms of, hey, you know, in, in, imagine a, 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 a remote language uh, where, you know, uh, I want any piece of text converted to somebody speaking that language, this is a very powerful system, and people are willing to pay money uh, for the system, which means it's going to generate a lot of value. But the person who provided that voice, they were paid for that 100 hours or 200 hours of data that they provided, and after that, they're completely cut off uh, from the ecosystem. Right? So the question that we are asking at Karya is, how can we create pathways wherein the value that is generated by these AI services can be proportionately shared with the people who created the data that enabled the AI service in the first place, right? So we feel data cooperatives can be a great answer to this question. Uh, in, in short, the idea behind data cooperatives is to empower communities uh, which generate some piece of data with the ownership of the data set, right? And that ownership uh, essentially can uh, create additional income opportunities for them through royalties. And it can also provide them agency over the data in how the data is used and uh, who can use the data. Right? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very tough problem uh, for, for, for various reasons. And you know, like I said, uh, as an organization, Karya has been, uh, I mean, this is the future that we want to build. Uh, we are a young organization. Uh, Karya literally means work in most Indian languages. Right? And uh, our goal is to essentially provide dignified income opportunities uh, through AI-enabled work for people in you know, low-income and vulnerable communities. Currently, our focus is in India. So to enable this, we have built a digital work platform, which is uh, uh, mobile-first. I mean, in India, uh, you know, smartphone prices are going down significantly. 
uh, uh, data connectivity is, is improving as well. So if people, uh, even in low-income communities, have this connected device on their hand, you know, can they actually uh, use that uh, uh, technology to uh, earn uh, income on the side, right? So that's, that's, that's our goal. Uh, our platform is inclusive, so even though connectivity is improving, there are regions which don't have internet connectivity, so we've built it such that you know, our platform can work even in regions without internet. And uh, we want uh, to pay living wages to all our workers, right? Uh, not, not just minimum wage. So our wage rates are, today our wage rates are around 40 times uh, the minimum wage in, uh, in, in various parts of India, right? So in, in just the last one year of operation, you know, we have been able to distribute over 25 million tasks uh, you know, to over 25,000 workers. So that speaks to you know, the, the amount of work and the scale uh, that, that we can potentially reach. Right? And what we also find is that you know, a high wage rate also comes with high quality of data. Right? So in some sense, it's not, uh, I mean, uh, lowering the wage rate uh, may not even be in, in, a, in our interest because you know, it actually significantly hinders quality. Right? So, we have done, uh, we are taking two approaches uh, to uh, moving towards this world of uh, data cooperatives. And the first approach is legal, right? Again, you know, this came up in, uh, I, I don't know if you paid attention to, uh, you know, Joel's answer uh, to the last question. You know, the, the, the first approach is a court case. Uh, the second approach is, you know, uh, blockchains, where, you know, if you can, if you can use technology to, to, to somehow, you know, track data, right? So uh, here goes our first approach, uh, which is essentially through licensing. So we have created uh, this class of uh, licenses called the Karya Public Private uh, Data License. Uh, these are adapted from uh, Creative Commons licenses. And uh, what these licenses allow us to do is uh, uh, ensure uh, that, uh, uh, you know, ensuring and creating the pathway that I, that, I, that I spoke about. So I'll just quickly talk about these three licenses. The first one is a, a non-commercial license. Uh, which allows uh, you know, us to publish the data in the open, uh, which allows a lot of research to happen around data. I mean, often the data that we are collecting from low-income communities uh, also are in languages where there is not enough data available, right? So it's, it's, it's in our interest to put out the data in the open so that there's more research in those languages. Today, predominantly research happens in English or you know, a, a few uh, you know, uh, European languages. Uh, by, by putting the data out in the open, we can you know, force the research ecosystem. But this license also ensures that uh, anybody who's procuring this data and creating machine learning models or creating data derivatives put that out in the open as well, right? So essentially, it sort of creates this GPL. I don't know if people know about uh, uh, GPL, which it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a software license which you know, makes code uh, uh, contributions viral. Uh, so we are trying to create something similar to, uh, similar to in the space of data. Right? The second one is sort of a commercial, uh, non-exclusive license, you know, which essentially prevents data silos, where you know data is locked in with one organization, uh, and therefore you know that organization significantly benefits from all the uh, good things from the data. But uh, uh, with, with this license, we essentially allow workers to generate additional value by licensing the same data to multiple different organizations. And finally, you know, we are working, uh, the, the last one is, you know, a commercial limited time access where, I mean, I don't know, today, uh, there, there used to be a time when we used to buy software. Uh, today, if you go online, you subscribe to software. I don't know how many of you have seen this. Uh, and subscription essentially means that as long as you find use in that software, you keep paying, right? Can we create something similar for data, right? As long as an organization find value, finds value in some data, can they keep paying uh, for the data, right? That's the third, that's the third type of license. And finally, I'll end, end with this uh, you know, idea on how we can use technology to essentially you know, uh, enforce some of these, uh, some of these ideas. Uh, like I said, today the data flows uh, you know, from the data workers all the way to the uh, data uh, organizations that need the data. Uh, instead of giving them the data in the clear, can we actually put the data in what is called a confidential computing system? wherein the data never goes in the clear to the organization. Rather, the data sits in this uh, intermediate system, and the person who wants to consume the data, they just submit a program, saying, hey, run this program on this data and give me the result, right? And in this case, the program can be outputting a machine learning model, right? So they put in the data into the confidential system, and they get the model, but they don't see the data in the clear. They want to use the data again, they have to go back to the system, right? Which uh, essentially uh, does two things. One, it eliminates the need to share data in the clear, which means it, the agency completely goes to the person who owns the data. They can determine who can use the data and when they can use the data. The second thing is also allows us to measure how many times my data is used, which gives me a true measure of the value of my data and therefore can be priced accordingly, right? So this is a technological approach that we are looking at. So I'll just end my talk there. Uh, you know, uh, we feel data cooperatives can be a, a, a powerful uh, concept you know, in sort of addressing many of the ethical issues that surround uh, the data ecosystem today. And there are several challenges to be addressed. I mean, around awareness, a lot of people 
people don't even know, uh, you know, the concept of, you know, the, the data that, what, what is the data that they're generating, how the data is used, uh, uh, what is the value of the data, and, uh, uh, you know, awareness is, 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 is a big first step. And then, you know, uh, we need uh, uh, both legal and technological means, uh, you know, to enforce, uh, um, you know, ideas around data cooperatives.